make a few uh, announcements and uh, here comes another one. Come on. uh, we are so, so grateful for the way people have been have been pitching during this this uh, summer and, and now it's going into fall. It's been so different and uh, that people have been involved, have been giving of themselves to, to try to pull the congregation together and, and to keep us focused in uh, our, our lives, Christian lives, that's what, what this is all about. And uh, today we are coming together to worship our Lord and Savior, and we are so grateful for that. Okay, uh, for uh, our announcements, one of the questions I was going to ask you, have you seen anything different in this church that you've come back from your COVID holiday. Yeah, that picture. This picture. And uh, do you, you, does anybody know who did, who did that? Yeah, that was great. So, uh, yeah. our, our sincere uh, thanks to Bernice uh, for the beautiful artwork. And she did that in, in, a, in an hour. Oh no, I'm just kidding. It was that one day. But anyway, uh, on the wall was the baptismal tank. And thank you, Bernice, and God bless you. God bless you. For your, for your talent and your sharing of that talent. And uh, that comes from the whole church. We just appreciate that so much. You have been a phenomenal part of our, our uh, fellowship here. We appreciate that. So remember the daily threads that are out there? Uh, on the table, you need to avail yourself of that and look at that material. Uh, and you won't get COVID from touching that, I don't think. Uh, Pastor Vlad has put out some interesting information on the Slavic Gospel Association Canada. Uh, that's the kind of information that we can glean from looking at some of that stuff. And also checking the bulletin for it as well. Then uh, we want to uh, send our sympathy to the Patterson family on the death of Helen's brother, Corey, the funeral of Cal Friday. And so uh, let's just remember them in our prayer as we, as we uh, think about our extended family and the church. And we also extend sympathy to Annette, Layman, and cousins and friends on the death of Annette's sister, Ben Hell on Friday. And we have no word yet on funeral arrangements. I don't know how many of you remember when she was attending our church here quite frequently. And uh, yes, she has gone home to be with the Lord. And I'm sure that that she is in peace and in comfort at this time. Then we want to, to remind you again to remember the height. You know, today meet at Spirit Sands self-guided trail at 3 p.m. Up to, it's about a 45 minute drive from here. Is that about right? So here we go. Is that right? 45 minutes, right? Uh, from the from Nepal south on Highway 5. So if you stay on Highway 5, pass. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. All right. I was going to say Minnesota, but I knew that. <laughs> uh, so you will need shoes and socks because it is it is sandy. So if you have shoes, they'll be filled with sand before you go. And uh, also bring along water to drink if it's dry. And then we want to remind you that uh, when you get your bulletin, you read the, uh, the, our, the, the articles about our partners in mission from the prayer line. Tim and, and Kaylee, or Carl, Kelly Hutton from Bolivia, and also Bill and Janice Dick. Uh, Bill and Janice are in, back in Canada, but they're still continuing their ministry, their work in Bolivia via uh, computer. So uh, there's some uh, there's some interesting information there. So you have time, you uh, read that because that will also help you and uh, pray for you. All right, uh, Lord, come on up, and we will start our service this morning first with singing. We have come into His house and gathered in his name to worship him. So let's uh, start uh, 
They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what it is. May the Lord add his blessing to this word and help us to understand and uh, make it a part of our life. At this time, I will ask Matthew, may you, may you to come on and give us a special Come on up.
The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are treated badly for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the desire for other things. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundred times as much as had been planted. So again, let me emphasize, 
The great teaching virtue of the parable is that it stirs up an interest. So first you just catch the interest of the hearers of the audience and then you just unfold and just tell your story. The simplest definition of a parable is to say that, oh uh, let's see, is to say that it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The simplest definition of a parable is that it is an earthly story about our day-by-day -day living with some heavenly meaning. That's how Jesus used parables. Another point to be made here is that another great virtue of the parables is that it enables and compels a man to discover truth for himself. To discover truth for himself. The parable says, here is a story. What is the truth in it? What does it mean for you? Think it out for yourself. What does it mean for you personally? And think it out for yourself. So use your brain, use your little gray cells in your skull trying to understand. What does it, does it mean for you to live in Nepal in 2020 Canada? How is it applicable for you? So, it is the earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And in a few moments, in a few minutes, we're going to see why Jesus chose such a parable of the sower, or about the farming, about planting the seed or seeding, uh, because it was such a familiar uh, seed image for most people, for all people living in Palestine in those days. So, number three, another point, why the parables are important and good to be used. One more point, supporting the virtue of parables. The parables conceal truth from those who are either too lazy to think or too blind spiritually through some prejudices to see. And you know, it always worked this way in the history of humanity. Some people are very keen on thinking. They turn on their critical thinking. They always want to hear the second and the third and the fourth opinion before making any conclusion. But there are always people who are just too lazy to think. They trust whatever they hear, they trust whatever they see, and they don't have any additional questions. Other people have been too spiritually proud due to some prejudices. And let's be honest, my dear friends, we have, we develop sometimes in our lives the whole list of prejudices towards some people who speak differently, who look differently, who are dressed differently, who just do their work differently. We kind of, wow, that's weird, that's strange, that's okay. Why is he doing this? So, Proverbs or parable, parables conceal truth from those who are either too lazy to think or too blind spiritually through some prejudices to see. Another thing has to be mentioned here. The parables put the responsibility on the individual. That's how Jesus was telling the news about his kingdom to many people living in Israel. The responsibility is on your shoulders, is actually in your heart. Whenever you hear the message, you cannot avoid it, you can, you, you can try to forget it, but you won't be able to tell to the Lord later on, say, I never heard it. I mean, I lived in Manitoba all my life, I never heard it in Nicola. Never ever anybody told me about that. No, neither preacher, nor just lay person from any church, nobody told me. So the parables were a means of sorting out Jesus' followers, discovering who had come just because of the miracles, and who really wanted to understand his teaching about the kingdom of God, his good news, his message of the gospel. And there has been always a case in the history of human race. Some people just come and they want to see something spectacular, something miraculous. Like, wow, wow, wow. I'll go when I can see those miracles. But some people always came and keep coming to understand Jesus' teaching, to chew and digest Christ's message and apply it, living it out in their lives. Now we're coming to the main part of the message, and uh, in verses 1, 2, and 3, let me just uh, set up that scenery of, of that parable. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, we are in verses uh, 1 and 2. That same day, Jesus went out of the house 
and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. That's a picture. If someday you go to Israel, in the days when uh, COVID-19 is totally dead and people will just forget about it, someday the Lord will bless you with such an opportunity, go to the Sea of Galilee area. And actually there are some bays. It's a very interesting geographically location. In some parts of the lake, it just, uh, without microphone, without amplifiers, without our sophisticated sound and speakers equipment, things like that, you can sit and you can hear pretty well if you even go up on the hill. If it's a base surrounded by high hills, it's a perfect acoustic system. And so that's what Jesus was doing on that day. The crowds, people were just coming, were just flooding in to hear his message. He was way different from any rabbi who had ever taught in Israel. Way different. He behaved, he lived different, he spoke different, his message was filled with love and hope, and people were just drawn to see and hear Jesus Christ. Then he spoke many things to them in parables. Then he told them many things in parables, saying. So he started teaching them. Jesus told this parable on the seashore, not in a synagogue, as we have just read. The doors of the synagogues were closed against Jesus, and he took to the temple of the open air, and often taught men on the village streets, on the roads, and then by the lake sides, and in their own homes. That was his methodology. Jesus went where people were. On Friday nights, in, uh, on Saturday nights, in many communities across our big and beautiful vast land, you can see people going where on Friday night? Tell me, remind us. Friday night, Saturday night. Whether it's a small community or a big community, people go where? To have a booze. To the bar. To the bars. And actually, once uh, the COVID restrictions were lifted up in many communities across Canada, people just went to the, they rushed to the bars to meet their bodies, to share their stories, to listen to the local community news of gossips and rumors about their neighbors and who is getting married, who is divorced and breaking up with whom, and you just need to go to the bar. You do not need to pick up your bad and press paper. Just go to the bar. I'm not saying go to the bar. No, no, no. Just to hear the news. I hope oh, God is forgive me. So, we can use Friends, the same methodology of Jesus in delivering his message of the gospel to the people. Go where the people are. Don't go to the bush where nobody's going. Go where the people are and try to bring them the message of Jesus Christ, his hope of salvation by faith in him. That day refers actually in our context of this gospel to the day on which Jesus' mother and brothers came looking for him. In Matthew chapter 12, a little bit uh, before that, in verses 46 and 47, it is says that Jesus and his family members came to him, probably to persuade him to stop the preaching and teaching. Remember, Jesus grew up in the family of the carpenter. Jesus, your father Joseph is a carpenter. Continue, support the family business. Why do you need to go that preaching? To become a street preacher. Why? Your dad was a carpenter. Keep going. Continue his dad's business. So they tried probably to stop him. On that day, Jesus already healed many people of various diseases, explained the true character of the promised Messiah, declared that unbelieving Jews would be condemned by believing Gentiles on the day of judgment. And although the religious leaders in Israel Many of them had rejected Jesus. He remained very popular with the common people. And great multitudes, crowds, still gathered to him in fascination to hear him speak and to see him heal. People were just drawn in masses to Jesus. He was so different, so different. Now we know the reason, having the whole Bible in front of our eyes. He was God in human flesh. He was a Mashiach, uh, Yeshua Mashiach, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. So he was very popular with the common people, but hated, he was not accepted by the religious elite in Israel. The beach sloped sharply, 
upward from the water. I think I've already mentioned that location. The people were able to see and hear Jesus best while he was sitting or seated in the boat. Not everyone could attend synagogue's meetings. If you remember your Bible, if you read it, if you were ceremonially unclean, that day or that week you could not go to the synagogue on Sabbath. So, but outside, in the open air amphitheater, people could come and hear the message. As we have read in verse 3, that he spoke many things to them in parables, saying. Jesus did not explain, it's very interesting, the meaning of parables to the multitudes, but only to his chosen disciples. Verses 10 and 11 in this chapter, verse 18. So, the parable was a common form, in those days at least, of Jewish teaching. That's how Jewish rabbis, they taught the audience by means of parables, by means of telling them of the story. In the series of parables, in chapter 13 of Matthew, Jesus uses very familiar figures from life as soil. Does anybody understand what soil is? Kids and adults like soil, dirt, call it a dirt, seed, we are living in a beautiful farming community. You don't need to drive far away from Nipoa, east, west, north, south, south, and the desert there. Okay, we're going, we're hiking there. But you might still find some farmland. But then probably it's better to drive west, east, and north. Birds, children, adults, do you know who birds are? Right now, in the middle of beautiful September month, we can see, we can hear them. You know, and sometimes they even drop something from the air. Fogs. <laughs> Sun, wheat, tares, mustard seed, leaven. How about leaven? Little kids, do you have an idea what leaven stands for? If you have mom or dad who's a great baker, or your granny, your mammy, or your grandpa, they will tell you after the service. Leaven. How about hidden treasure? I think you understand this term. And a pearl. Pearl. Precious, expensive pearl. So now we're coming to our pearl. Verses uh, 3 for 9. So, uh, a farmer, I like this part of the international version of maybe a farmer. Everybody understands who the farmer is. In fact, you relate, must be related to some good farmers. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Some fell in rocky places where they did not have much soil. It spread out quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. As Jesus told the story of the sower, his hearers perhaps could have seen a man, a farmer, actually sowing the seed. In any case, that seed or imagery was familiar to them, whether they were farmers or not. In Israel at that time, there were two ways of sowing uh, seed. I hope we can find those. Okay, I like this picture on the internet, and uh, so you can find some, sometimes some good stuff on the internet. The first way was when a sower scattered the seed as he walked up and down the field with a seed bag slung over his shoulder. If the wind was blowing, like some of the seed would be caught up by the wind and blown to all kinds of places, and sometimes, in fact, often out of the field. That was a hard way of doing farming, as always. The second way was a lazy one, but still pretty common at that time. A sack or bag of seed was put on the back of the donkey. You can call it John Deere, Case, or New Holland, whatever friend you are, those uh, dealers, with a hole in the corner of the sack. Then a farmer walked the animal, the donkey, up and down the field while the seed was running out. That was the lazy farmer technology doing this. So in Israel, the fields were in a long, narrow strips. If you've been on the plane, I'm sure most of us, before this crisis, actually, it's pretty fun to be, say, 
several thousand feet above the ground, and you can see those uh, squares, rectangulars, those long streaks of land. It's pretty cool to see. So in Israel, the fields were long, narrow strips, and the ground between the strips was always a right of way. It was used as a common path, and therefore was beaten as hard as a sidewalk. That is what Jesus meant by the weight sign. It was so well trodden, it was so hard, unbelievable. It was impossible in those days to control accurately where all the sea fell if you did it manually by hand. You can ask our respected farmers like Herman and maybe Bruce and others uh, whether you can trust nowadays as they do see every spring, whether it's 100% accurate whether they can achieve that, have that kind of accuracy using our modern equipment and technologies. But in those days, if you do it by hand and the wind is blowing, you still try and you have to trust the Lord. So, let's consider now the types of soil in, in this parable, first from natural point of view and then spiritual point of view. Number one. The soil on and beside the road, you can call it wayside, was untilled and packed down hard by walking, which prevented any seeds from penetrating and taking root. Those seeds were exposed and easily acceptable to birds of the air. Whenever you see, uh, whenever you are in our beautiful province in springtime, you see those birds, those gulls or seagulls or whatever they are called in the English language, they love seeding. Whenever the farmers start seeding, they're there on the fields. It's their feast time. The birds came and ate them up once the farmer got a safe distance down the path. They're just there. That's a feast day. That's number one soil from natural point of view. Number two, the stony ground was not filled with stones. It was just a thin skin of, of, of earth on the top of the underlying shelf of limestone, limestone rock. And we're living in the province where you can actually find lots of places with limestone uh, rock. For instance, Camel Stones, Provincial Park near Swan River. Someday if you have good quad, a good four-wheel drive, you can make it. But don't drive the van over there. Or Steep Rock Cliffs in Manitoba, beautiful area. Next summer, if you've never been there, go. So, something like, like that. Number three, the thorny ground was a deceptive one, was a tricky one. When the sower was sowing the ground, it would look like clear enough for a while. Every gardener, if you have a veggie garden, knows that the weeds grow with a speed and strength that few good seed can equal. True or false statement? True, unfortunately. It's a result of that original sin in Genesis chapter 3. In fact, God told you, from now on, guys, whether you're a farmer or not, you will have to work in the sweat of your eyebrow, like working like a horse, like a donkey, like breaking sweat. And you'll be weeding and planting and watering and just unrooting those weeds all the time, enjoying good physical exercise. So, the result was that the good seed and the weeds grew together. But the weeds were so strong, and remember that cartoon, that they choked the fire. They were so strong. You don't need just to take care of the weeds, they just grow. So number four, another type of soil. The good ground was deep and clean and soft. Black, fertile, thick uh, layer of dirt. If you just want to see that, go to Ukraine, some parts of Russia, some parts of Romania, and you can find that, ooh, it's just, there's a word, Chermazel, Chermazel. Black fertile soil, just really, I remember my uh, days when I, every summer my parents took me to the village where my grandparents on my mother's side lived. And I remember that big veggie garden, thick, black, after a rain, boy, just, wow. Could just slide in the dirt, and it was so, so, so clean, so, so black, and so deep, and just unbelievable. So the seed could gain an entry, it could find nourishment in such a soil, it could grow unchoked, and in good ground, it brought, it brought forth an abundant harvest. Now let's deal with Jesus' interpretation of this parable in verses uh, 18 through 23. We're coming to the spiritual understanding of those four different types of soil. 
verses 18 and below. When his disciples approached him asking, Lord, explain it to us. And we can get it, I mean, tell what it means. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was, what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Uh -huh. The person, the first type of the human heart. Uh, yeah, okay, that's good. The unresponsive hearer. The person does not understand God's word because of his or her own hard-heartedness. And Old Testament uh, defines those people as stiff-necked. Such hearers are indifferent to anything spiritual. They only want to live in the world they can see, they can hear, they can touch. Well, this is my toy. Okay, I can see it. I can put it into my mouth. This is why I'm living for it in this world. But anything spiritual? Come on. This life is only about my flesh. Eat, enjoy life, and die young or middle-aged or elderly, but that's what I can see. The word does not make any penetration to his heart and mind. Does not make any penetration into the heart and into the mind of that person. And that, in fact, if we are honest enough, I remember myself, once God's people started sharing His Word, the message of the Gospel, with me in early uh, 90s. I was a college student. I remember somebody came to our university after a class. They were allowed to do that in Ukraine back then. And two guys, two young fellows from the First Baptist Church came. They brought the Gideon's, uh, pocket-sized Gideon's Gospels, and they told us the Gospel. And I was like, ha, 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 I mean, you're crazy. I mean, I'm 23 years old, life is good, I'm young, I can run, I can jump. There are lots of beautiful girls around. Why do I need any to believe this stuff? I mean, you're telling me, boom. Such a person is a fool. And to be honest, my dear ones, we have lots of fools around. And maybe you are one of those. It's not my word, I'm not making it up, it's in the scripture. Such a person is a fool who hates wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And he says that there's no God, those fools. In Psalms 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. The fool is a person who says, there's no God. This life is, all, is only about what you see, what you hear, what you eat, and what you can use with your hands. Such a person is self-sufficient, self-satisfied, and often, and often self-righteous. I don't need God. I'm good. I'm a hard worker, I'm a moral person, I have never killed anyone, I have never stolen anything, I'm basically good. Get out away from me, Christian. Get out of my way. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, that's a verse in the New Testament. Good one. Remember it. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, I don't know whether I have it. Um, yes, good. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, 
lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. What a verse. The God of this age has blinded their spiritual eyes. Who is this God of this age? Satan, the evil one, Lucifer, devil, whatever. He has blinded the eyes of millions and millions of people live in this world. And they do not want to believe in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Unless the shine of the gospel, unless the God does the work in their hearts. The unresponsive hearers, that first type of soil, hear the word of God somehow, somewhere, and do not understand it. The wayside was never intended to be sown. The message of the gospel comes in at one ear and goes out at the other and makes no impression, no impact. Second type of spiritual soil, or the soil of human heart, and how people respond to the message of the gospel. In verses 20 and 21, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with a joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And I'm not opening the new continent for your friends. How many people, how many churches across the world have lost, which is confirming the truth of Jesus' parable? I remember clearly, once we had the board meeting way back in Ukraine, and we were a good-sized church, at some point 500 members in downtown of uh, our city, and we kind of had a discussion, why so many people came forward, why so many people repented of their sins, just they cried out in front of the whole congregation, confessing their sins, believing in Jesus. Where are those people? Where did they go? Like maybe more than a thousand, maybe 1,500 people prayed the prayer at church services in our church building, but we were the congregation only 500 people. Where did they go? Because they had no roots. Because the soil of his heart is, yes, is shallow, such a hearer has no firm root in himself. His feelings, emotions were changed, but not his spirit, not his soul. There's no repentance, no remorse over sin, no recognition of brokenness. As a result, there's no humility, which is the first mark of true conversion. My dear ones, one of the major marks of a true conversion to Christ is when a person, a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, is humble, meek, who is ready to surrender his or her rights, giving you the way first. That's a great mark of a true conversion to Christ. Humility. While well, even in the days where so many people around us are so puffed up and proud and arrogant, this is my way. Get out of my way. I'm driving here. Get out. No. Such a hearer is like that unwise builder who built his house on the sand. Remember Matthew chapter 7, verses 26 and 27. The persecution reveals who is a true believer in Christ and who is a false one. Listen now carefully. It is not only about physical persecution of believers that reveals who is true and who is a fake one. Any crisis. How about COVID-19? It was announced like six months ago. And some people, in fact, quite a few, in many churches, used it as an excuse of not coming, of not fellowshipping with other believers. And you know that it's a true statement. They used it as an excuse. I'm afraid. I'm spoke out. If I get it, am I going to die? But nowadays we know that how many people died of it? Very few. Very, very few. Any crisis shows by sorts people out in Christ church. So, such hearers are very glad often to hear a good message, a good sermon. Wow. You can ask them. Was the sermon okay? Yeah, that was great. But ask them the same question just in a couple of days. What was the sermon about? Well, ask this question in a week. They may be pleased with the word, with the preaching, but yet not changed 
or ruled by God's message. Such heroes endure for a while, but do not endure to the end. At the sign of a true converted believer in Christ, that that person endures to the very end, to the very last breath of his life. He continues, she continues in the Lord. The third type of human, of human heart, or the soil of human heart, or the third type of human response to the message of Christ. In verse 22, the worldly hearer, uh, the worldly hearer, verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the words of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word making it unfruitful. You know what the word is telling us here right now. This is a part of our life. We want, we need the toys and the things our neighbors have. How can I live not having what my neighbor has? This hearer hears the word of the gospel and may even make a profession of faith, but his first love is, not, is for the things of the world. Such a hero loves the riches of this world and lives as if they are answers to all his needs and desires. And don't go far away. Remember yourselves, my dear friends. Once you bought your first quad, um, you put your helmet on, <laughs> I'm going to the bush on those trails. Remember when you, some of you bought a boat, your first feeling, you're on the lake, you're on board. <laughs> And you have your fish lines, and you have your friends, you have your buddies, and we all have lots of fun. Remember when you bought your cabin the first time on the beautiful lake, beautiful sunsets and sunrise, and you have the keys. Now I can sit on the deck, relaxing, sipping my coffee, seeing the slave for the rest of my life. But how long is our life? It can be a person who comes to church but never becomes committed to serve, who is continually preoccupied with money, career, fashions, sports, work, and everything else except the Lord Jesus Christ and His kingdom business. He is a busybody who does not have time for Jesus to pray to Him, read and study His Word, and fellowship with other believers. And ask yourself this question, who has made us so busy? Christ? The devil? Ourselves? Who has made us so busy that we don't have a minute, an hour, a week, a day, just to sit down and pray to the Lord, open His Word, and just feed our soul from God's Word? Prosperity destroys the Word in the heart as much as persecution does, and more dangerously, because it is much more subtle. The rocks spoil the root, the thorns spoil the fruit, and we have to be very, very careful. Now we're coming to the good part of the story, of this parable. It's all about us, everyone sitting in our beautiful sanctuary, including the preacher. That's who we are. The fourth type of the spiritual soil, the fourth response of human beings to the message of God. Verses 23. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. How we want all of us to say, Amen, brother. It's about me. I'm that kind of a Christian. That's my response. The soil is rightly prepared by the Holy Spirit. That's the work of God's Spirit in the heart of a sinner. In fact, if you remember yourself clearly, before you became a Christian, somebody had sown the seeds of the gospel into your heart. Somebody told you, somebody explained it to you, somebody showed you the beauty of Christ and His message in word and action. There was somebody in your life. And actually someday, let's have a service, a service filled with testimonies whom God has used to bring you to Himself. It could have been your dad, your mom, your grandparents, your friend, your spouse, someone. 
So, the soil is rightly prepared by the Holy Spirit. Such a hearer hears God's word and understands, understands it. Anyone who is ready to accept Jesus Christ on, on God's terms is a good soil. Let your will be done. That's how Jesus prayed to the Heavenly Father. That's how His apostles did ministry of the gospel. Let your will be done, not mine. The ultimate work of the genuine believer is fruit bearing. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22, 23. It's a scary self test, self examination. What do you have a chance, friends? Read that scripture, Galatians 5, 22, 20, 23. Is it about me? Is it, is it about my husband and wife relationship? Is it about my parenting? Is it about my relationship at work? Am I that kind of a person? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wow. Is that real? Is it possible? Everything is possible with God. With God, everything is possible. True believers bear fruit in great abundance. Lots of percent. Maybe I just did my math wrong, but lots of fruit, lots of abundance. The true disciples of Jesus bring forth the fruits of righteousness. They are distinguished from hypocrites of this world. They endure to the very end, no matter what happens around them. They are not perfectly free from the remains of sins. Some people in this world, you can hear it often from them, from unsaved people. You Christians are a bunch of uh, hypocrites. You only need my money. You just need me to come to the church, drop my big or small box into the plate, into the bag, and that's what you need from me. That's how people do churches. Crazy. Because they think that we must be perfect but they don't have to be perfect. So we need to tell and explain in humility, patience and love the message of the gospel. We are not perfect. We are only saved, thanks be to God, to Christ. We are happily free from the bondage, from the grip of saints in our lives. But on and off we sin, don't we? Think about yourself, not about your neighbor. Think about your own life. When you come back home after the church service, when you sit down at the lunch table with the kids or whatever, and you know your kids, are they perfect? How about your spouse? Is she perfect? How about you, man? Are you perfect? Good husbands? Just talk to your wives after the service. Are we always good and perfect? Finally, the good part. As in any message, life application. What does it mean to us how we can apply this, this uh, parable of the soul? Number one, uh, oh, yeah. okay, it's coming, it's coming. Test your own heart. Always start with yourself, your own heart. Which kind of soil you are today? Today, not 10 years ago, but what kind of spiritual soil you are today? Speak to God in prayer. Open the scripture, read it, meditate on it. Another application is, confess your sins before the Lord and correct something in your life with God's help. Oh, how much we need God's help and His grace to transform us into the image of Christ. We cannot achieve it on our own, never. But confess your sins before God, openly. Don't hide your sins, because He knows, anyways. He can read our thoughts. He can read our dreams. Number three. That's where we often, unfortunately, fall. Study God's Word and apply it in your life. Spend time with Jesus daily. Spend time with Jesus daily. You know, you probably noticed that. When those uh, computers, especially smartphones, came to the market, if you go to an average uh, public school, even Christian school, there's a recess time, there's a break time. And I remember when I was a kid, I always could see the faces of my friends, the faces of the teachers, the faces of my classmates, because we did not have cell phones. I'm speaking like an old guy. I graduated from the high school in 1988, behind the Iron Curtain, the Red Eagle Empire. No cell phones, no color television. Some people like had started having color television sets. But I mean, what a blessed life. No 
cell phones, no smartphones, nothing coming in and out from your box. Nothing is making no sound. <laughs> Something is kind of like every hour. People find always time for their smartphones, go to the school, go to any business, and they just, they're walking like this. This recess time, those kids are very active, they're physically, you know, just entertaining themselves, they're running, leaping, and jumping, no, they're just sending and checking something like every minute. Give us a break. But we, as adults, as parents, are often no different. Once we have time, what are we reading there? Spend time with Jesus daily. Find time to the Lord and you will be blessed beyond your imagination. He's the only one who can feed your soul, your spirit, your mind, your heart. Not the news. Number four. Whenever you sow uh, God's word into others, that's important, into others, do not expect quick results. Especially in our post-Christian culture we are living in. Do not expect quick results. People are proud, they're stubborn, they're self-sufficient. They have all their toys. They have many toys to play with. It takes time, so in patience, with hope and love. Patience, hope and love. And be very sensitive, be open to the guidance of God's Spirit when to share. When the, good, when the good time is to share your faith with others. You know what often works? Just ask a person whom you love, whom you care about, can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? You will find very few people who will refuse or reject your request to pray for them. Most people say, yeah, you can pray for me. Ask, how can I pray for you? And people will start opening up. A quote from Charles Spurgeon, who used to live between Minidosa and uh, Nicola, sorry, no, 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 I'm just checking whether you're still awake, good, you're responding, you're awake. Charles Spurgeon often is called the king of preachers on the British Isles in England. He was a committed, devoted servant of the Lord and he preached for decades in London. He was quite a man. Once we get to heaven, whenever you ask this question, what are we going to do there forever and ever? Wow. We'll be in the presence of the Lord, we'll be, we'll be able to see all those saints and then we'll have a chat. A good English tea with Charles Spurgeon. Sorry, about that. I think he liked tea. So, in 1855, it's a part of his quote. I really enjoyed it. It is Jesus that makes us fruitful. You cannot make it yourself on your own. You need God's help, Jesus' help, the work of His Holy Spirit into your, in your heart. God will make you fruitful. But let God make you fruitful. Just let you, just open yourself before God. Don't run away from Him. Finally, some questions uh, just for our consideration, and uh, it will be, we'll be done. Not done forever, but with a message. Have you noticed any spiritual growth in your life in recent 5, 7, 10 years? Ask this question, maybe not right now, but at home. In recent 5, 7, 10 years, have I grown spiritually? You may have, said, you may have noticed that, yeah, I've grown Likewise, like around my waist in recent 5, 7, 10 years. No, no, no. Spiritually, spiritually, have you accumulated gained some spiritual wisdom and knowledge of the Lord? Do you rejoice in the Lord? Are you happy to be in the Sunday morning to be at church? We are bored and burdensome. You're saying, boy, I wish I would have stayed in bed with my remote control. Wow. Or with my phone. Instead of coming here. I mean, what a boring place to be to open the Bible, to hear the message, to drop some money there instead of just filling my pockets. Do you rejoice in the Lord? Do you want to fellowship with other Christians? That's scary, especially in the times of this announced pandemic. Do you want to fellowship with other Christians in person? Are you afraid of shaking a hand with a Christian brother and sister, now making it more scary? Are you afraid of giving a hug to your Christian brother and sister? Wow. Is the Lord Jesus your love, your passion, your everything in your life, or something else? Are you tired or, or bored of being a bride of Christ? Remember, especially when I'm speaking to guys, when you were dating your beautiful girl, your future wife, remember your first date or any date before like, 
I, mean, I, 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 I just did not just walk, I was running that distance to see my future wife. That's how we are supposed, expected by the Lord to expect our bridegroom, our Christ, when He's bride. And He's the most beautiful, the best groom ever, our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we, are you, am I genuinely saved? Am I truly saved? Am I truly the child of God? If you are, then go and serve the King. Let's go for prayer. Yes, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this parable, for your clear teaching. Thank you for the whole counsel of God we can study in your word, in the Holy Bible. Thank you for your love, your patience to us, long patience to us. Lord, we are often spiritually messed up. We often fall. We're not patient, we're not loving enough, we're not caring enough. But Lord, you've given us your grace, you've given us your Holy Spirit, you've given us your word and your promises. You establish, you made your covenant with your church. And the time is coming when you will take us home to be in your presence. Lord, help us to understand your word. Stir up interest in our hearts to be the diligent students of your word and the users of your word. Those who are lived and controlled by you most of all and all the time and wherever we are. Thank you for this parable and Lord, uh, make us to be the fourth type of the soil. The responsive and grateful hearers and doers of your word. In your precious name, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that all God's people can say, Amen. Amen.
for uh, benediction. Uh, I'm reading uh, the verses recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 11 through 14. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit may be with you all. Amen. We're dismissed. The service is over. Go and serve your King. And go to hide this afternoon. God bless you, King.